Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, sticking with our recent pattern, going through the uh, list of current release viewers, release candidates, we have the GPU table update at long last. Um, and then also a collection of maintenance changes, and we will have, again, the Google Breakpad shortly. Uh, it's being rebuilt um, to catch up. So that will be out. There are a few others, the usual suspects that, have, that are hanging fire um, and keep telling me that they'll be out any minute now and keep not quite getting out of QA. So um, I'm afraid that lately uh, QA has been winning the perpetual battle between QA and engineering and who gets to do things. So uh, I I decline to predict when any of them will will actually break out of QA and, and get into a release channel. Um, but uh, coming soon, presumably. Um, yeah, when they're, or when they're not known to be not ready, at least. Um, so I do have uh, a query on behalf of the inventory team. Um, if you could let me know whether or not you've begun using the AIS v3 interfaces um, and or when you have at least experimental viewers that you could use uh, to participate in a pylon test. So, yeah, I suspected that most of you have not yet begun to shift over to that to any great extent, but... Um, We're starting to deal with the upstream merges now that we've got a release out. But um, we've not done that yet. Okay. Um, okay, well, Nix, why don't you throw that out now, then? That's a good time for it. All right. Uh, hi, all. Um, as Saz mentioned, my first item was actually to mention that we're going to be looking to do a inventory pylon at some point in the future. Um, so uh, now is a good time to start your merges. Uh, I actually just about two minutes ago uh, pushed an update to Sunshine External. Uh, so you guys should have our latest and greatest. Um, it does uh, build uh, on Team City. The builds should be available in another couple hours. Um, but uh, again, this is not formally QA'd. Uh, we've been testing things as we've been going along, uh, but it is not ready for release yet. Uh, but now is a good time to start doing your test merges and get uh, side branches uh, up to date with that. Uh, I also wanted to point out a specific uh, fix. Uh, so in our refactor, um, we actually uh, are changing uh, some of the messages uh, on startup. Uh, specifically, it used to be that when you logged in, uh, you would get the server telling you a list of things that it thought that you were previously wearing. Uh, only that message only had room for one wearable of each type, and it may or may not be up to date with the current outfit folder. Um, the current release viewer um, pretty much ignores the contents of that message, uh, but it does still wait on that message for timing, um, and we're doing away with that. Um, you should not have to wait on that message to start your processing. You should be able to start uh, resolving your avatar from your current outfit folder uh, even before you get that message. Uh, one of the implications of this is new users who have never populated that uh, particular row in the, data, um, in the database um, and who use an older viewer uh, may not resolve on their first login. Um, we have a fix for that, um, and I'll be sending an email 
uh, out about that, uh, but you need to make sure that you have that fix uh, in your branches, otherwise uh, you might see some issues with new users. Um, I'll get you guys a link to that. Uh, hopefully by the end of this meeting, I'm trying to hunt down the change set. Um, any questions on the status of Sunshine? Not so much as questions about it, just that um, in case you guys don't, don't know, Tank is our, our merge master, and so he's really the guy to communicate in regards to where we are with merging um, server-side appearance stuff and um, inventory changes. And as always, if you guys uh, have any uh, questions or difficulties with your merges, if you have any questions about the new system, how it works, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, even if they're not immediate, I should be uh, reasonably available uh, in world or via email. Okay. Um, so. Thanks, Nick. That's. That's all good stuff coming along, and we'll be hoping that uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks we can, can begin doing some some uh, serious testing collaboratively with you. Um, interest list changes, by the way. Uh, I've been I've been watching the process of the presence of that uh, the process of the various. QA passes it's been through. Um, it does seem to be homing in on a, a solution, but um, I, I want to thank uh, several people from this group uh, for contributing pointers to places where, where problems showed up, uh, because as usual, finding good repros for the problems is much more than half the battle, and uh, you all have been a, a big help uh, in that regard. I very much appreciate that. Um, I have not heard anything more about group bans other than that um, QA was particularly hard on it. So uh, Baker's had to go back and uh, rethink some things. So that's a good thing because it means it didn't get out in in uh, with the problems, but it uh, it does mean it's it's delayed a little bit further. Um, but I don't have any more update or predictions on it than that. Um, and I think that's what I had on the agenda today. So the floor is open. I'd like to talk a little bit about our 64-bit, and I'd, I'm interested in um, Singularity's findings with theirs as well, but I guess we'll start with ours. Um, so the Firestorm 64-bit went out. We seem to have some issues with uh, crash reporting. Uh, Oz, you and I have talked a little bit about this. Uh, we've been looking into it a little bit further. It seems that um, we are reporting our crashes, but freezes aren't being included for some unknown reason, and we're still investigating that. So the uh, crash rate come Monday stats is going to show that the... Um, yeah, it does sound familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> It's going to indicate that 4.5.1 has this incredibly low crash rate, uh, which uh, isn't realistic. Um, it raises the question, though, why is the viewer freezing so much? If suddenly we, we know that we're not reporting freezes, but we are reporting crashes, and the crash rate without the freezes is really low, then that would suggest that there's a lot of freezes happening. So it sort of raises some other interesting questions that we want to look well, into. I can I can actually because we've been doing a lot of work on this on the Google Breakpad branch. I can actually give you a little bit of more detail on that. Um, freeze is kind of a misnomer. Um, there are a few places in which the viewer um, can correctly well thinks at least that it can correctly detect what the source of a of, of a crash is. The, the the real easy one is um, we hit a an LL error you know uh, assert um, that 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 forces a crash um, yeah there's um, there are a couple of 
there are a couple of other cases where um, either uh, the the viewer's exception handling or or brake pad can can accurately determine what the what the source of a crash was and and categorize it as one of the other flavors of crashes. You know, a crash that happens during startup, a crash that happens during normal execution, a crash that happens during logout. Um, and uh, and freezes is what gets reported if it's not one of those other things. So it turns out uh, we have we have found in looking at them uh, in the course of debugging Google Breakpad and more deeply looking at the different kinds of crashes, um, it turns out that some of the mechanisms for detecting that it was one of the other flavors weren't working. So um, there was there's a lot of stuff that's getting reported as freezes that is not the viewer hang uh, hung and you know the, right, the, so the PC got turned off, right? It's some of some of that categorization is bad reporting. Um, so we've been through a few rounds of that. Um, when you merge the Google Breakpad branch, which you know hopefully will happen at some point, uh, we're still kind of slogging through that. Um, it, it's a it's a really annoying thing to have to work on because really the the uh, the ultimate debugging test is that we put it out there and let a couple of thousand users have it for a while and then look at what we get in crash reports and determine whether or not we're actually getting good data. Um, it, it's kind of hard, you, you really difficult to simulate all the all the many and varied ways that Second Life users find to uh, exit abnormally. <laughs> um, uh, so... Um, so anyway, we're still we're still slogging through that process. But one of the things that we've done in in the course of that is that we have uh, greatly simplified and and cleaned up the creation and interpretation of the marker files that are used to create those crash rate numbers. Um, we've also moved the creation of them much much earlier in initialization and the and and much much later in logout. Than they were before, so there are there are big chunks of code at either end that used to not be considered part of the, 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 f during which there was no reporting um, that is now inside the the reporting envelope, if you will. So um, it would be good if when you merge the Google Breakpad branch eventually, um, it's not time to do that yet, but um, or at least I wouldn't recommend it yet. Because uh, you're just going to have to do it again. Um, when you get to that point, um, be careful to look at all of that marker file handling and make sure that, it, because I know that, you know, initialization and termination in code is is frequently a mess. And so try to make that match as closely as possible what we've done, um, so that our numbers are in some, at least in some broad sense, comparable. Um, it, it's that part of it seems to be much better than it was. Um, what, what we're mostly focusing on right now is is um, improving the the accuracy and, and completeness of the actual um, crash upload stuff. Uh, so, uh, well, we're a bit. Uh, I mean, we're disappointed, obviously, because it was kind of important that we have accurate crash reporting between the 32 bit and the 64 bit. Because uh, obviously a lot of people want to know <laughs> if it's more stable or not. So, but I guess that's going to have to wait until the next uh, revision. As far as user um, feedback is concerned, we've not, I don't think, have had any reports of in in any release we push out. We always get people saying, "Oh, it's really crashy or it's unstable, and I can't stay on it. Keeps you know going to desktop." I've not had any reports that I know of. Um, from users on the 64-bit, but we have had a very wide variation of people saying, oh, it's 10 billion times faster, and also people saying it's 10 billion times slower, um, frame rate-wise. And uh, so that's interesting. Um, some systems, it would appear as some systems it works better on than, than others. Um, we don't have any hardware information to... to compared to, but um, that seems to be the feedback. Um, um, Latif, I see you're here. What? How's it going with Singularity 64-bit? What's your kind of feel? 
Well, the performance-wise, I, I personally don't see any uh, difference, uh, nor do our alpha testers see. Uh, but surprisingly, we have uniformly positive feedback regarding uh, regarding stability. Everybody reports that the 64-bit version is is, uh, is uh, stable in the conditions where uh, the 32-bit would sometimes fail, like in a very crowded places with a lot of people and a lot of attachments. The 64-bit was rock so solid, stable, and the uh, 32-bit was known to fail in those conditions. Yeah, that's kind of the same for us. We're, we're getting no reports of instability on the 64-bit, but we are getting, uh, we've had some reports from people saying that when they go into a region where there's other avatars, their their FPS drops drastically um, to an unusable state, whereas on the 32-bit, um, you know, it stays fine. But we've also had the opposite report. But the one thing that seems concurrent is is nobody's complaining about stability, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I found it a bit surprising because you know, first of all, we had to recompile all of the third-party libraries, and you can always mess up something and miss some flag. And the second thing is that, uh, you know, it's the first time we have a 64-bit uh, Windows version, and although the viewer is mostly clean when it comes to integer types, there are still a few oddball places where I found uh, stuff like using long t uh, type directly without uh, the, the specific uh, length, uh, but but so far, as I said, reports on, on performance about the same stability, much better. Yeah, same same for us, I think. I certainly, I, I've not noticed uh, any difference between the 32 and the 64, um, going back and forth between them. But um, I've not crashed in the, no, actually, that's not true. I did crash once in the 64, but it was, uh, I think it was a Windows problem. But um, Monty, we've I've not seen any indication that 64-bit uses any more memory than the 32-bit does. Uh, it, 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 in singularity, it does use a bit more memory, but uh, but yeah, but it's not significant increase. Um, and I have, even though we have shipped with this uh, large address aware flag aware viewer for a while in 32-bit uh, Windows version. It the uh, it supposedly lifts the, the memory limit from two gigabyte to three point something. Uh, I we have noticed that the the, the Windows version really likes to crash when it uh, allocates about two gigabyte of RAM, no matter that flag. And and when it gets close to two gigabytes allocation, which can happen in a very busy place, it tends to crash around there somewhere. And, and obviously the 64-bit version doesn't have that limitation, so that's why maybe we are seeing that the 64-bit is uh, more stable. That's what I'm yeah. thinking too, because we have this memory crash. Well, we just call it a memory crash, but it's it, it's been happening for, I think everybody has it, actually. And the 64-bit obviously can allocate a lot more memory, so it, it's not reaching that that critical point, I think. The, uh it, it has been true for a long time, by the way, that um, all viewers, the, the aggregate viewer statistics, um, show better stability on the 64-bit Windows platform than on the 32-bit oh, versions of the same OS. So, um, which, which, you know, I've always attributed to, um, you know, bugs in the 32-bit version, version of of Windows or the drivers uh, or other other infrastructure that we're taking advantage of uh, that we're not hitting on the 64-bit versions, but um, I, you know, I obviously we haven't tracked down why that's true, but there has been for quite some time, uh, almost as long as I've been watching the statistics, um, there has been a noticeable difference between them. Not huge, but but significant. Um, I think I think we're going to find uh, with. The next, I'm not. We're not going to do an emergency release to fix the crash reporting on this. I'm afraid, um, but our next release will have it fixed, obviously. Um, and um, so, Oz, the next question I have for you is: When are you going to give us a 64-bit compile of Havoc? <laughs> That's a fine question, and uh, I will relay that question to the appropriate people. Um, 
So, uh, and and SL voice would would be another obvious. That would be another yeah. thing for us to build. Yes, uh, I think six to four bit is here to stay. It's people are going to demand it now. The worms are out of the can. The voice is not that critical because it's a separate application which talks to the viewer over a pipe, so you can easily mix and match there. Shipping 32-bit voice with the 64-bit viewer works fine. Right. Yes, that's true. But if it's any more stable, that would be fine too. Um, but that that we would have to get from Vivox anyway. Um, uh, yeah, I will. Uh, that the the whole subject. Uh, has the fact that you guys have been releasing 64-bit versions has not gone unnoticed, um, and we're 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 watching your results uh, with great interest. So uh, we appreciate you getting out there and getting the arrows in your back. Uh, are, are you first. getting? Because um, we we screwed up our crash reporting, but are you getting anything from Singularities? They're 32 versus the 30. They're 64. I have just uh, added the, the, the architecture to our uh, crash report. The, the, the original Linden one break part doesn't report it, I believe. So we didn't have data before the, the, the latest latest alpha. Uh, and now we'll be what, able to tell. What you'd be a, what you would need to do, Latif, is have a different channel name. So what the what the firestorm. Bill did was oh, put X64 on the end of the channel name because that's what the raw stats system is driven by. That, that, uh, Latif, that way we could see from Oz, uh, from Linen Lab stats uh, our three, oh, the yes, yes. 64. So we might do the same thing, but I added additional field to the re to the crash report, but. For the statistics for a linen lab, yeah, it would be useful if we added a 64 at the end of the channel name. Yeah, that way we could determine. But actually, if, if in fact, though, if, Oz, isn't it true that if, uh, if they're using the same channel name, then the next set of stats from linen lab should indicate Singularity has a lower crash rate? Just because yep. there's more people on but a, like, if 64-bit has a lower crash rate, that would drop their overall, wouldn't it? The, the yeah, don't it would be hard to figure out how much. Yeah. Um, we don't have it in the release yet, so sometimes our alphas show if enough people use them in the stats, if they get over the threshold. You can see Singularity Alpha in the in stats report. Yeah, the, and, uh, I, I have Singularity Alpha 1835-something. In the report, uh, but it's let, just let barely me. over the threshold, so it's it's crash numbers don't really mean anything. Um, we are we are planning to to make a release soon anyway, so we will see when when. That if gets, you're going to be uh, changing channel names anyway, it would really be helpful to me if you would make the the release channel be Singularity Release. Singularity, space release, or dash release, whatever you want to do. But uh, that way I can filter out things like your nightlies and, and alphas, which, you know, the, the numbers are so small on that it's not really worth it. Yeah, Singularity Alpha has a different uh, uh, channel name, but you want the release to have Singularity release as well. Yeah, that way I can look at just Singularity release and get numbers or ah, I can look at singularity okay. release and singularity alpha but what i get now is uh, what i what i'm reporting now is anything that starts with singularity which gets me an enormous number of things that are really actually not very interesting yeah okay i see i see i will know that thanks so we do um we do firestorm release firestorm beta uh, dash release dash beta or dash nightly yeah, I don't really care what separators you use, or even if there are none, as long as I know what the what the discriminator is. Um. Yeah, so uh, we we are watching those stats, and I would be delighted to be able to also share the difference with the Singularity team when there's a way to. Um, and there's a way to see the discrimination a, a little more clearly. Um, so, uh, and all that's all that's good. 
and um, who knows? Maybe one of these days we'll be able to convince the powers that be here that it's time for us to uh, do. do well, one if it of shows that it is more stable, then it might be worth the extra yeah. effort of having one more build to release. But uh, Oz, I wanted to ask you about channeling. Um, and we, we talked about this before as well. Channeling between Mac, Linux, and Windows. Because it, remember we did that one time by accident, and we discovered that Mac, I think it was Mac, that actually has a really much higher crash rate than Windows does, and that makes it difficult for us to, without being able to do this regularly, it makes it difficult for us to uh, wonder or to figure out uh, what operating right. system we need to look the for crashes same, on. The same data set that has uh, the that has the current crash data in it has the uh, the platform data in it already. So we we can tell that difference apart. Um, uh, it's just that we don't have the reports built for it yet. Um, it would be I, really last time I was in California, I sat down with somebody to, to work out what reports we wanted, but they just haven't bubbled up to the top of the stack of things to implement yet. Um, so I will... I will. Uh, I in fact, just uh, day before yesterday, I harassed people about that and said, "Boy, I really would like to have those reports." And and they said, "Yeah, yeah, hasn't hasn't gotten done yet." So um, I'll uh, I'll try harassing people again or, or uh, getting we, getting I mean, some we of have my professional singularity testers involved. Singularity has crash reporting as as well. Um, crash log. You know, sending of the crash logs to to the, the project as as do we. Um, but Nikki was telling me that um, a lot of the crash reports that we get have no uh, dumps associated with them, and so she was also wondering if the freezes could be uh, if that could be the freezes because that, nothing is being sent with it. Uh, no, it it not always. It's some, for example, one of the things we found was that uncaught exceptions weren't generating stacks. Um, that's the biggest thing that we're working on in the Google Breakpad branch is trying to to prune out the uh, the the reports that don't have stacks and mini dumps. So, uncaught exceptions show fine in our uh, in our uh, in our crash report because uh, I found that, uh, for example, uh, Linden Lab uses uh, boost file system without uh, doing it in try catch blocks and a boost file system function calls throw exceptions instead of uh, returning errors yeah it's so. in LL file system library inside the viewer yeah um, right uh, I, I'm sure that there are lots and lots of places where we're not catching exceptions we ought to be um, but the, the difficulty I was referring to was not those. It's the fact that we don't have, there, we don't have the reporting of those was, was wrong. But once we fix the reporting, I'm sure we'll be able to, we will then be able to see that what we had was a lot of uncaught exceptions and we can put those try catch blocks around, around things. But you're right. Um, uh, so. I'm wondering why, why your crash reporter doesn't see those and ours is does and ours is more or less the same thing as uh, the break part from from the from the from the source from your source i don't know i don't know i just uh, i actually at one point when i was uh, helping out on that project i actually just threw in a uh, raising an exception just as a test and found that the resulting dump didn't have stack data in it. so uh, but i think we've actually got that one fixed in in our uh, it, that was on a Mac. I don't know if it, if it's different on other platforms, but um, we're we're focusing on that. So that's what that's really what the Google Breakpad branch is all about: trying to fill in a lot of missing data about our crashes. Uh, and hopefully, we'll we'll make a bunch of progress on that, and then we can use that information to drive down crashes a little bit more. Are you able to separate out Linux and Linux 64-bit as it stands now, or does that need different channel identifiers also? 
at at the moment, the easy way for me to see that difference would be as if the channel identifiers were different. In in theory, the data is there, but um, in in practice, I don't have a report that shows it. So, um, uh, so the, the 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 practical answer is for the time being, if you put the difference in the channel, then we can all see it. Okay. Other topics for today? I see a few people typing. HTTP. Good one, Drake. Monty, do you have an update? Um, yeah. It's a not terribly exciting one. Um, the mesh code is in QA. Uh, QA guys ramp aggressively trying to find problems, uh, none so far, other than a very slow performance on Mac in general, on uh, old MacBook Pros. And uh, not a regression, it's always been that way, but uh, it is frustrating. Um, it's going to be probably two weeks before he finishes, I would say, That's, but uh, no promises there, and then it'll become a project viewer. Um, while this is going on, I've started the next phase of this, which will include both server and viewer pieces again. And this is the HTTP pipelining piece. But I've also gone through, and a necessary part of that it is updating the third-party libraries, and I discovered how, well, what an interesting state our third-party repos are in. Um, and I've been spending a great deal of time updating some of them. So we're getting happy, there will be a library refresh uh, at least partial one coming along with the next work and possibly broader uh, because I'm so irritated at the things. Some things that are happening are, well, I would love to burn that thing down and start it over. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> the repo is so abnormal with LQT WebKit. Um, but I actually building it better now. I've, um, one goal of this thing is I'm moving the Linux baseline from a Lenny, a Lenny characteristic to a squeeze. So it's 4.6 compilers, squeeze baseline, a few other things. And uh, LQT WebKit is getting some attention there. And I'm also going to try to get it off uh, a lazy Mac system as well. Um, the code base is peculiar, but I may actually be able to get that thing updated to 4.8.1. Right now, it's a, just a fragment of the necessary libraries. It looks like, well, briefly, going down the list, OpenSSL, Aries, Zlib, LibPNG, FontConfig, LibXML, Boost, uh, LibQt, WebQuit, Curl, and SDL will get attention by me. Um, if I get ambitious and aggressive, I'll do everything. Well, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. lot of time. But the it's, yes. You call it interesting, and that's exactly what the state is uh, of those repositories, because, uh, you know, regarding this 64-bit discussion, I had to go through all of them and compile 64-bit for Windows, and I found state of those 3P library repositories to be really... I was wondering if Linear Lab was using them at all, considering what states were I found them in. <laughs> What I found was that we actually hadn't built them in a year and a half, um, which is why they've rotted. Um, so we used products built a year and a half ago, and um, basically our build farm and build plumbing has all changed since then without rebuilding them. So the, um, there are some issues there. As I go through these things, though, but I'm, I am canonicalizing the libraries, uh, the repos. Uh, vendor branches are real vendor branches, uh, default branches, real production branches, and there's merge continuity as um, the versions step forward. So it actually gets made rational uh, after I've touched it. LQT WebKit may be the exception. It is a very confused repository. I don't know if I can actually repair the damage without restarting. 
and so I actually may restart or just live with whatever the thing is. But the things are also going to get readme files. We're going to tell you what we've modified, describe the gotchas. I've got a checklist in the libraries. What not to do when you do a check-in because um, most, of course, most of the configuration processes modify files. And there's been a nasty tendency for Linux to check in modified files that should not be checked in. So all that crud is getting cleaned up. Richard Linden has been poking me and trying to get me to build everything 64 bit, but I'm not scheduling this <laughs> quite yet. But uh, I mean, I've done 60, I worked on Alpha in 93. I've been doing 64 bit for 20 years. I uh, would not doing it. Is, my personal opinion is absurd. Um, but you see what the libraries are like. It's going to be a bit of work before we can clean all that stuff up and, and have it building consistently. On the server side, I've got a talking point or a, a area of discussion. Um, this past, I'm also going to look at possibly more aggressively limiting connections up into the capabilities um, services. As we drop connections down, I actually want to start pulling resources back and be give rewards to clients that behave well and um, those that are sort of abusing the commons uh, will be recognized and uh, perhaps um, uh, get less responsiveness. And mainly it's about connection limiting. Um, the problems we've had with Mesh in particular uh, I may start being very aggressive about connection policy. So what I'm throwing out there is basically this. Uh, uh, connection counts over 25 will, might be dealt with harshly. Um, a soft guarantee of somewhere between three and five keep alive connections uh, that can be mostly reliably encountered, uh, used by a viewer. This is not a not a design, not a spec, not a claim, but it's a, a point on the on the dartboard. Is that per per service or per capability? Oh, per um, server. Total endpoint. So 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 three to five connections for both textures and and uh, meshes because those go to the same endpoint. A minimum. That will be the floor. The ceiling will be maybe a hard 25. We are currently allocating uh, four to each, so maximum of eight connections from singularity to 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 that endpoint. So I'm wondering if we are going to get hit by that harsh limit. Um, I mean, well, we certainly test well before that. Uh, Back uh, earlier this year, when DirtSim 203 went forward, and that was the first Keep Alive work, we put those magical test regions up on Aditi, in other words, the happy regions and the angry regions. And the angry regions were actually an example of that. And uh, we definitely repeat that kind of process again before we'd ever decide to uh, go forward with anything. But that was just these are just some numbers I'm throwing out there as possibles and giving you an indication of what I'm thinking for the future to um, protect the commons because they really are being abused. I go through the logs and I can see that people on even other regions are being impacted by a few users. And it is something I can't turn my back on anymore. Forgive me for being a layman. Um, and this might be slightly off, but there's been a lot of people who I think are misunderstanding what it is that you're doing um, and making accusations that the result of what you're doing is going to slow down everything for everybody else to accommodate people on slow computers. And since this is being recorded, maybe you could clear that up. No. Computer speed won't be a matter of slowness. Um, the goal is... Well, put it this way. For our capabilities, we specify a sort of a rate limit. We are, anticipate that um, any user coming in can use a particular service at a particular request rate. Uh, depending on where you are in the world and how good your network is, you 
approach that with various degrees of accuracy. If you have a high ping time, you don't get anywhere close to it. The goal in all these prod these this effort is to um, raise everyone up to the same level to actually approach those limits rather than push everyone down to the same bottom level. And on this subject, uh, when the mesh code moves forward, there actually will be some technical posts uh, to explain this and describe what we've been doing and what we would like to do in more detail. But the goal isn't to push everyone towards the bottom, it's to get everyone up towards the limits and then push beyond. The The issue is, is very rarely um, one that manifests at the endpoints of the network. Um, in, in particular, almost never at the client. Um, the issue is at the is primarily at the at the intermediate points in the network at the at the various routers that your that your packets have to traverse uh, to get, to get through to the simulator, um, and to some extent at the at the simulator itself or, or whatever the service is, whether it's the simulator or the texture baking server or whatever. If you're if you're creating a lot of connections. The process of setting up and tearing down connections is itself a, is fragile compared to actually moving data over an existing connection, um, and uh, and it's also um, in both of those are affected by how much UDP is going on. But but um, but what Monty is mostly affecting is how how many simultaneous connections you can create. Um, it there is there is some performance benefit to be gained by creating lots of connections if they're all short-lived connections there is even more benefit to be gained by uh creating long-lived connections over which you send many requests simultaneously which is uh, which is what the pipelining phase of Mahdi's project is is all about. So even slower computers will benefit from using that strategy once the servers and 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 everything in the in the pipeline is capable of of coping with it, which you know has been a long process to get there, but we're we're closing in on it now. Um, the unfortunately the benefit to everyone of having that superior connection management regime, which which ought to provide better performance to everyone, is largely it can be very severely impacted um, by even a fairly small number of people who are still doing as as uh, Tank said, creating a thousand concurrent connections because those people are whacking everybody else's connections. And tearing te tearing down both the performance and the reliability of those other connections. Um, so that's why we need to have, as a part of this general strategy, we need to have um, policing on the at, at the simulator end, at the server end, that says if you are exceeding the number of uh, you know what we think is a reasonable number of connections, um, then we're going to just cut you off. We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna clobber you so that you don't have a disproportionate impact on what everybody else is doing, which is using this better connection management strategy that in the end ought to provide even better performance. So um, it's it's a complicated picture. And in order to really understand all the various impacts, you have to not only look at um, the at the endpoint, at the simulator and at the and the viewer, but at every piece of equipment in between, and and if you ever run trace route, you'll you'll find that you know you're you're typically running between you know at least uh, ten or twelve, and and often twenty or thirty um, routers in between in between you and the, and the uh, and and all the links in between. So there are lots and lots of opportunities for things to get stepped on. Um, Hopefully that'll clear things up for for folks who don't understand. You know, it'd be useful is if you had, and I know you guys have nothing better to do, but <laughs> be useful to have some, you know a little wiki page on what the HTTP HTTP I can't even talk now what that project um, is doing in like layman terms that the average Joe can sort of yeah. understand. Yeah, well, it's a, it's 
but the average Joe may be a tough target to hit. But actually, yeah. Monty has drafted a really good blog post on all this, and it will go out with the uh, with you know oh, when, good. The, when the it, when the pipelining viewer does. Uh, you know what? It needs a Torley video. That's what it needs. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Torley is a genius at illustrating things, but I'm not he sure. He is very good, but he can, he tried uh, illustrating I'm not sure, HTTP. <laughs> I'm not sure this particular one is, is all that amenable to, uh, to illustration. The most fragile point of those 15 hops is actually your first home router. <clears throat> because most people run uh, network address translation uh, routers. And those needs to keep track of uh, incoming ports and mapping them to outgoing. And that requires some CPU processing for each TCP packet that arrives. And those routers ship with some really, really slow processors. So if you open a bunch of connections, their CPU just, you know, kill over and fall. And, and you get very poor results if you do that on, on, on most of those uh, home uh, cheap routers. Yeah. But one question. They, they are a very, they are a very, very fragile point in this. Uh, and by the way, lots of um, lots of ISPs are running NATing routers at the next top up. So, um, but you know, but those are more powerful than I've uh, yeah, they're, done they're done better, those. But, yeah. but you can still one, knock them over if you've got a few users running thousands of connections between the same two endpoints. One question I had uh, for Monty was, uh, uh, were you involved in, in making this uh, new baking service that came out with the server-side appearance? Because that seems to be working very well, and I'm getting like, uh, in testing, I was getting, uh, you know, five to ten-fold uh, speed downloading bigs from the central server than downloading textures from the from the region server for the local textures on objects. And I was wondering if something like, like that could be done grid-wide for, for, uh, for print textures. Uh, actually, yes. Um, the, um, that's, well, effectively what you're talking about is a content distribution network. And uh, we've considered that for a long, long time. And we'd love to do an experiment when we get a chance. Um, but yeah, that is absolutely a direction. We could go. How, how is how how is the baking server uh, uh, how is the baking server service implemented? Is that a CDN? No, not a CDN, but it is. It's it's a separate service handling all of that material. And it's is it's it using... financial that is it financial that makes you makes on the lab not make that decision to do that right now, or is it something uh, else? Yeah, nothing to say. I can't. I, my pay grade doesn't um, give me insight into that. But the banking service is well provisioned with hardware. And, and it, it works really, really well compared to the, the region service uh, hosting the, the, the regular textures. I will pass on your compliments. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there are there are reasons, there are historical reasons and technology change reasons why it would be more difficult to, to do that with other kinds of textures. Um, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that it's a, it's a longer and more complex process. Um, and until we've got the HTTP usage changes that Monty is making, we wouldn't see nearly as much benefit from it as we will if we do it after Monty's changes. So that's why we're focusing on, on what Monty's yeah. doing. The, the, the thing that I see is that if region is really busy with, with say, 50, 60 avatars, the, the texture speeds get really slow, and I, I was wondering what the limiting factor there is. Is it that the CPU on the, on the region server is, like, overwhelmed, or that the network on that server is overwhelmed, or, or what... what yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't think we have an answer for that that we can that, that we can say with any authority. Um, I mean, we have some theories, but uh, we can't. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily always the same answer either. Um, That's the answer. Will, it's not one right, thing. Right. It, um, the 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 changes Monty is making will will improve not only the performance of things. We we are pretty sure. But also our ability to uh, diagnose what's going on 
Um, uh, an enormous amount of what Monty has been doing has been adding instrumentation at many points where we didn't have it um, so that we can tell whether or not we're making a difference. Um, and uh, that will enable us to tune things better uh, over time. So um, we'll see. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the, the baking service team uh, took an appropriately paranoid approach to this, and it has paid off in spades. So You guys did an amazing job. I was just this curious about uh, about the region service because, you know, theoretically you should be, you know, able to cache all the textures that are on that region and should be able to act as a effective proxy for that, but that does not appear to be the case and the texture download speed seems to be proportional to the load to the number of people on that region, so it was just an observation, not, not a call to any action or anything. Yeah, well, that's a that's a that's a good observation. Thank you. I have a quick question about SL Share. Yeah. So uh, Cinder was looking into that as we merged it into um, our local and um, discovered a few things. The and don't get me wrong, we're not ex we're not overly concerned about it because we don't think it's a good feature, anyways. Just got to throw that out there. But some people are going to like it, and what they're not going to like is that when they upload to Facebook their image that they've taken on a region, um, it is uh, capped at 1024 pixels by 1024 pixels and highly compressed, making it very pixelated and uh, very ugly. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, that it automatically includes a slurl to where the picture was taken uh, and a whole bunch of text uh, or character spaces that are left for Google um, Analytics. And so some of the questions are, are we going to destroy your servers if we up that 1024 by 1024 pixel limit? Probably. Um, the second question is, can we kill the slurls? Because that's just sort of privacy invasion, I don't know. Um, and the third, can we kill Google Analytics? Uh, those are not questions I can answer now. So, write me an email with the whole. They're on the record, and we'll and we'll. Us? Yeah, you but if you want an if you want answers to those questions, send them to me in an email, and I will get yes. you answers. Yes, okay. I can speak briefly. Um, as far as the uh, the JPEGs and and the pixelization, the the uh, compression, um, that's something the team is actively working on and trying to find some ways to improve that. Um, it's not quite as simple as changing the compression level. Um, we've got our own compression, and then apparently Facebook does some in there. Um, we're looking at that. Should have an improvement before too long. The other issues, please write, send to Oz, and, and we'll look into answers for those. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. Good, good topic, though. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to try and resolve those questions. Um. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of us on this team, we're not big Facebook fans. It's nothing to do with Zagat Life. We just, a lot of us hate Facebook, and, and I know there's a lot of people who hate the idea of associated Second Life with Facebook. But on the other hand, there's obviously use cases like performers and artists and bloggers and whatnot. So. Well, there, there are people using the feature. So um, I, I haven't looked at recent numbers, but I, I, it's been pretty popular, actually. So um, while there are Clearly, are people who who want to avoid that. We've been careful to make it easy for them to. Do well, that. yeah. The nice thing is it's optional, right? So right. we're good with that. So, uh, Twitter. Oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, um, no, no comment on 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 unannounced features that we may or may not ever do. Uh, You're starting to talk like me. It's a dead giveaway, by the way. <laughs> Not if you say it about <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, how are we doing here? We're running up against an hour. I'm, I'm out of topics. Any other hot topics? 
All right. Well, this was this was a very, real good meeting. Thank you very much, and we will <laughs> uh, we will see I use, you. I use the word hypothetically usually when I get into that as well. That's yeah, a good one will, to use. We will see you in two weeks. <laughs> okay. Thanks, folks. Have a good weekend. Take care, everybody. <laughs>